This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking today with Walter Carter. For years, he was the in-house historian at Gibson Guitars. He has a new book out titled The Epiphone Guitar Book, a complete history of Epiphone Guitars. It's published by Backbeat Books and available from Amazon.com, your local bookseller, and more than likely your local music store as well. And Walter, thank you for stopping by today. My pleasure. Walter, the Epiphone brand isn't considered by many to be one of the more, shall we say, heroic elements of the Gibson family compared with, say, the Les Paul or the ES-335 or similar guitars that have been in the hands of superstar musicians. What made you decide to do a history of the Epiphone brand? Well, Epiphone had a long history and uh, certainly a heroic period before they were owned by Gibson. Uh, which was before 1957. They were Gibson's arch rival, uh, and as many top players played Epiphones as played Gibson's uh, during that period. And actually, they were probably more successful than Gibson uh, in the 1920s as a banjo maker. So uh, they've they've had their heroic periods as uh, on their own. Uh, they had their followers in the 60s when they were made in the Gibson plant, but slightly different. And in, in the case of a few models, uh, there were features found on Epiphones that you couldn't find on a Gibson uh, at that time. And then yeah, the non-heroic period certainly began in the 70s when production was sourced uh, overseas. And it continued for the most part through the 80s, although there were some interesting models made during that time. And... It, it was my feeling that uh, starting in the 90s, certainly in the mid-90s, uh, that, that Gibson paid uh, a lot more attention to Epiphone quality and, and trying to um, establish the brand as not only a quality import, but uh, as a, a strong uh, brand with a strong identity of its own, uh, separate from Gibson. So I felt like there was a, a good bit to write about uh, that that really hadn't been covered in, um, by people like myself who have done books on the on the earlier history of Epiphone. Walter, as you said, the Epiphone brand has had a long history, one that has taken arguably more dramatic turns than Gibson itself. So let's start by breaking the name down. Who was Epi? When did he found a line of musical instruments? And what was the historical significance of the word phone in the Epiphone brand name? Okay, Epi... Uh, it's short for Epaminondas, uh, who was a Greek uh, general, a famous figure in Greek history. And uh, the Anastasios Stathopoulou uh, named one of his ch- children after, after that general. Uh, Anastasios was a, an instrument maker in Greece uh, who later moved to uh, Asiatic Turkey, uh, where Greeks were persecuted at some point by the Turks and then decided to bring his family to New York. Uh, he had several sons. Epi was the oldest, uh, and they ran the father's business after he died in 1915. In the 20s, uh, they developed a new uh, banjo and decided to come up with a new brand. They had been calling the brand the House of Stathopoulou, their family name, and so they took Epi's name, uh, epi, and combined it with phone, which was derived from the Greek word for sound, uh, the same root that stereophonic and uh, words like that come from, or phonograph come from. So they put it together to make Epiphone. And <clears throat> initially, uh, that was just a brand of the uh, of banjos, or a line of banjos. And uh, in the late 20s, that became the name of the company and then the brand that they, they stayed with from then on. In the late 1950s, Epiphone began to have what we would now call plenty of corporate infighting. What was going on there at the time? Uh, well, the corporate infighting at, at Epiphone actually began in the late 40s because Epi, uh, who was the heart and soul of the company, died during World War II of leukemia. Uh, and his brothers were not as uh, adept as, as he had been at running a business uh, and began arguing some, and there were pa- <clears throat> power struggles uh, among the brothers and um, involving other people that had been brought into the company. And so by the, uh, by the mid-50s, uh, 
uh, Frixo, the youngest brother, was out on his own and, and not involved with the company. Uh, and so uh, the remaining brother w- was uh, riding a sinking ship and decided uh, to put the company up for sale. It had, it had been sort of half sold in the early 50s to the Kahn Instrument Company that's famous for uh, making band instruments. Um, they obtained uh, a lot of the distribution territories and also took care of some of the manufacturing. So um, when uh, Orphe Stathopoulou regained that control, he quickly just sold the company to Gibson, and that happened in 1957. And then by the end of the 50s, Gibson was uh, making Epiphones. What was it about the Epiphone brand name that was so appealing to Gibson? And it gave them certain business advantages, right? Well, the main thing, the main advantage that that Gibson had in Epiphone was a second recognizable brand. Uh, Epiphone had a long history, uh, through the 30s especially, uh, as as one of the top makers of archtop guitars, and were certainly going head-to-head with Gibson during that period. So... By the 50s, uh, Epiphone had faded somewhat, but was still a recognizable name. So uh, initially, Gibson thought they were just buying uh, Epiphone's bass-making operation. Uh, Epiphone had continued making uh, stand-up basses after the war, which Gibson had not done. And so uh, Gibson was trying to acquire that capability uh, in buying Epiphone. It turns out that... uh, Epiphone's uh, situation there was overrepresented, and uh, there, there really wasn't much uh, base making capability. So Gibson quickly saw the advantage of having a second brand and were able to open up dealerships that could not get Gibsons because Gibson protected the territory of the dealers. But so if, if you were a dealer on one corner uh, and there was a guitar store on the uh, you know down the street a block. Um, you could be sure that they weren't going to get Gibsons, but they uh, they could have Epiphones. And to try to still protect the dealer, the Gibson dealers, uh, Gibson made Epiphones so the perception was that they were just slightly below a Gibson, which in some cases was true, in some cases not. Well, they were good enough so that in the 1960s, the Epiphone brand received a tremendous boost when a little-known cult act with a tiny following called the Beatles began playing their instruments. Yes, the... Uh, Everybody but Ringo, the, the other three guys, uh, John, Paul, and George, all bought Epiphone casinos. And exactly why they they bought that model, uh, we don't know. It's It wasn't the most expensive Epiphone, and it was certainly not the most expensive uh, guitar that was available to them. Obviously, they could have bought any guitar they, they wanted a thousand times over by that time. Um, but uh, John and... Uh, George, in particular, used those casinos on a lot of uh, recordings, and then John famously scraped the finish off of his uh, so that it appeared to be blonde. And it was one of his main guitars uh, through and beyond the Beatle years. So, yes, that gave Epiphone a huge boost. And the other main uh, name associated with Epiphone during that period was also uh, as important in his own right, and that was Howard Roberts, who was who had been the top session guy in L.A. for uh, through the 50s and, and the 60s. He played on you know every kind of record you can think of. Well, it certainly had some, some uh, very high-profile users. In the 1960s, Gibson manufactured Epiphones in the U.S., but at some point, Gibson chose to move Epiphone production overseas. Yes, the Gibson moved... Like all, all the American manufacturers were facing pretty heavy competition from uh, Japanese makers as the 60s progressed. Uh, and several of the major manufacturers just went out of business. National was one, and K uh, it was another. Just in the, the, the uh, onslaught of deluge, let's say, of, of uh, cheaper guitars, uh, just put them out of business. So Epiphone as a even though it was not really a budget brand, it, it was uh, it was sort of a midline brand. Uh, Epiphone sales suffered uh, in the same way. I guess people either bought a Gibson um, or they bought something dirt cheap. <clears throat> and by the end of the '60s, the solution 
appeared uh, to be to send production or, or to outsource guitars overseas. Gibson happened to, um, or Gibson's parent company, the Chicago Musical Instrument Company, owned uh, a distributor and importer uh, based in the uh, Portland, Oregon area named LD Heater. And they had a line of uh, guitars that they were importing, and they just sent a couple of guys from Gibson out there to look at the line, see if any, see what would work under the Epiphone brand. And they picked out a dozen or so, and that was it. That was a, that was the first Epi line. And then shortly thereafter, um, CMI was taken over by what became the Norland Company, and they they're better known as the villains, or usually the ones who are vilified for uh, destroying Epi's reputation but it, really the uh, uh, you know the movement overseas had already started before before Norland came in now all that started in 1969 and so by 1970 all the epis were imported by the mid 1980s Gibson was no longer part of Norland but Gibson's new owners decided to expand their importing of Asian made instruments under the Epiphone brand yes uh, Gibson was acquired in 86 by Henry Juskowitz and Dave Berryman and a third partner who, who uh, left the partnership within a year or two. And those are the, the current owners now. And I think they, they barely uh, acknowledged or, or, or knew uh, about Epiphone. They, they weren't concerned. Uh, it, it was just a blip on the, on the Gibson map. They had enough concerns uh, with we trying to revive Gibson, that um, they didn't didn't consider Epiphone as uh, being as having any value at the time, but they continued uh, to import what whatever had been imported the year before, and then as they devoted a little bit more attention to Epiphone, sales picked up. They devoted more attention to it, uh, sales picked up more, um, to the point where um, Dave Berriman, uh one of the partners began focusing most of his time on Epiphone while Henry Juskowitz focused on Gibson. And you know, little by little, the brand grew. And then around 1993, they hired Jim Rosenberg, uh, technically as a product manager, but uh, he was a, and, and still is with Epiphone, a gung-ho, almost evangelical uh, supporter of the brand. And you know, he called himself uh, Jim Epi Rosenberg. He signed the labels as president of Epiphone. There, there really wasn't such a position. But, um, you know, Epiphone buyers had a face of, of you know, a guy who, who cared about the, the, the guitar that, that they just bought. And uh, that, and, and really a, a very uh, you know, strong... Uh, attempt to to raise the quality of Epiphones uh, that that really did a lot to to put Epi on the map again during the '90s, and, and I think that just uh, Gibson never let up. And uh, once once that started, and like I said, Rosenberg is still there uh, and, and still instrumental in in, uh, in in keeping Epi in the position that it's in today. When I resumed playing guitar around 2001, 2002, after a long hiatus. I began to hang out at the popular Les Paul Forum website. Right from the start, they had a pretty strict policy of not allowing discussions of Epiphone Les Pauls there. Is that sort of tension between the Gibson owners and the Epiphone owners something you've noticed elsewhere as well regarding the modern Epiphone brand name? I would say most owners of a Gibson Les Paul don't consider an Epiphone to be a real Les Paul. And... Um, if, if you draw the lines that way, I, I guess you, you could agree with them. Um, the Epiphones are imports, and you know, some of them are very high quality. Some are pretty uh, inexpensive. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it makes you uh, aware, let's say, of how valuable the Gibson brand name is, uh, when you consider the difference in price between an Epiphone and a Gibson that appear to be the same guitar, they don't have quite the same electronics and uh, may or may not have the same uh, quality of materials. But uh, for the average player, um, you know, the the Epiphone is is, uh, is more than an adequate guitar, and 
it's it's easy to see why it would make the owners of a Gibson Les Paul uh, a little uh, jealous or <laughs> or resentful. Um, well, as far as collectability goes, there's uh, you know, there, there's no crossover there. Uh, the you know it's the old Les Pauls, and uh, to some degree, uh, particularly to the uh, in some corners of the Les Paul Forum, the uh, the reissues that come out of the custom shop, but um, you know, Epiphone is not uh, is not part of that world. When you were researching your book, what were some of the more unusual discoveries you made? Well, just the ins and outs of um, of Gibson's corporate world in the in the nineteen seventies were uh, haven't been written about too much. I mean, Gibson collectors. Until recently, I haven't cared anything about 1970s guitars and uh, or even late 60s stuff. For you know, the for most Gibson collectors, the uh, if it doesn't end in the 50s, uh, the the big the era of interest ends when Ted McCarty left Gibson in '66, the the general manager uh, who had been there since '48. Um, so there was, I mean, most people couldn't tell you who ran. Gibson, who the, the presidents uh, or general managers uh, were um, during that period, they they know the name of the owners of Norlin, and uh, but but there was a uh, you know succession of of, uh, of presidents and, and and plant managers and and product people uh, through those years who uh, were responsible for. A lot of different designs. I, I think maybe people know about Bill Lawrence's influence on the Gibson line in the in the early and mid seventies. Uh, fewer people know uh, about Bruce Bowen, who had started at Gibson as a product manager in the, in the late sixties as a kid, and I mean as a clinician, excuse me, uh, in the late sixties, and stayed with Gibson for another twenty years or so, and. Uh, had a, he was one of the guys that was sent out to LD Heater to pick out the new Epiphone import line. And through the years, he was in and out of uh, influential positions on the Epi line. And, you know, there were others like that up up through, um, you know, Gibson's uh, time in Kalamazoo, uh, which went to the, uh, 1984. And going back and forth from Kalamazoo to Lincolnwood, Illinois, where the corporate headquarters were. So there were, there were a lot of details and during that time uh, that were they were interesting that maybe they weren't earth-shaking, but uh, there, were, there were Epiphone models such as you know, the, those with the scroll-shaped bodies. Uh, there was a Nova line, which was a, a kind of modernistic flat top. Uh, there were reissues of the Emperor and the Sheraton and some of the uh, iconic models uh, from the 30s, or the Emperor would be from the 30s, Sheraton from the uh, 60s. And uh, the stories of, of how those models came to be had just never been told. And so I, I found it interesting and enlightening that, um, you know, to, to discover that, that there were still a few, a few people around um, who remembered the 70s and what went on at Gibson during that time. And Walter, last question. As with much of the economy, the music industry appears to be in plenty of turmoil as well, and Gibson is no exception. Under their stewardship, how do you think the Epiphone brand name will progress in the coming years? Epiphone was, um, and, and Gibson, uh, when Gibson, I should say Gibson with the Epiphone brand, was uh, one of the early uh, companies to uh, form an alliance with the China or, or take advantage of, of the opening up of Chinese manufacturing to American ownership. So they were uh, early on with a joint venture there, are several factories in China now. Um, and I think if, if, if that world changes and... Uh, as, as it did for Japan and Korea, as the, as the economy grew in those countries, uh, the manufacturing expenses grew, and you know, and, and companies moved. So, uh, as it is right now, Epiphone is, is firmly entrenched in China with some manufacturing in other places. And I think um, 
they are on they've got their arms around the world economy and the world market and will take advantage uh, and, and be a, a strong player uh, no matter what what way that turns unlike Gibson they're not they're not uh, bound and, and, and tied and uh, by a, a tradition so you, you're not going to be able to make a Gibson overseas uh, for example it, it's, it's just not going to be the same Gibson doesn't have, as a brand doesn't have that same world opportunity that Epiphone has now and I'm you know, knowing the people who have brought Epiphone to where they are I, I'm fully confident that that, that uh, they'll continue to be you know, on the leading edge uh, of uh, wherever the guitar market goes in the next few years. Okay. This has been Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we've been talking with Walter Carter, the author of the new book, The Epiphone Guitar Book, A Complete History of Epiphone Guitars. It's published by Backbeat Books and available at Amazon.com and your local bookstore. And Walter, good luck with the new book, and thank you once again for stopping by today. Thank you, Ed. It's my pleasure.